How's it going, Stanley? Yeah, it's going fine. Good. I'm Good. I'm glad for the nice work that you do for the for the Moon Society. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. I, I'm pretty inactive. I just pay my dues and I'm and I'm very interested in the course. Well, paying your dues, that's a that's a big start. <laughs> that helps. But yeah, yeah, well, hopefully we can uh, turn this into I, something. We can everybody can learn something new. I don't know if the United States is ever going to catch up, but you know, it, it used to be, you know, decades ago, because I'm much older than you, but you know, um, when Sputnik was launched, you know, as you know, you know, it, it got every, it got all Americans in a tizzy. We're not, are we being recorded yet? Yeah. We are being recorded now. All right. Yeah, we are being recorded. Yep. All right. Well, in, in any event, I mean, you know, uh, people really were roused to action, but, uh, you know the the Chinese recently. Um, you know you you know this. They they they've now entered lunar orbit, and I guess they're still in lunar orbit. But um, yeah, they're uh, they're making progress. So I hope that we. I hope you know. I'm glad they're making progress. I, I want I want all the people of the world to make progress. But I'd like Americans to uh, begin making progress also. Yeah, we kind of got to get out of our own way, though. Right, right, exactly. Well, maybe the uh, you know we the, a bunch of us in the leadership have been talking about what the what the society should be doing to you know enable that. Uh, if you have any thoughts on that, just uh, you know email me or whatever. We're, we're taking suggestions. We're trying to figure out you know. Like, should we change our vision, our mission? Should we, you know, focus more on one thing or the other? Mm -hmm. So, your presentation last month was very good. I really enjoyed that about the regular. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Today, uh, Dallas Bienhoff's going to do a presentation on. Orbital, orbital, orbital fueling stations, I believe. Hi, Dallas. Hello, Ben. How you doing? Hello, Stanley. I'm okay. How are you? Oh, good. Can't complain. So is your last name pronounced Bienhoff? Nope. 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 Long E. German. Long e. German. Long E. Okay, give, give it to me. Beanhoff. Like, Beanhoff. Yeah, like the green, like the green things or the pinto things. Got it. The kidney things, but not. Got it. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, people say Beanhoff, Beanhoff, Beinhoff. So <laughs> I I know a slight amount of German, but um, I know Hoff means means like court. Is that right? Yeah, like C O U R T, that kind of court. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think. Oh, yeah. uh, now wait a minute. I could or, be wrong. Or, or, it could, it be could also mean hope. H O P. Yeah. And now, be, I, now I'm thinking yeah. I don't know which one. But what the B I E N means, you know, maybe it doesn't mean anything. You know, I have no idea. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Bean garden. I, I don't know. Right. Bean house. I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I know zero that. German. I know zero German. Uh, oh, you know zero German. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, well, I, I thought that's in German. Um, no, no, that was 160 years ago when our family oh, came I see. here. I see. I mean, I, I know a little German from high school. That's all I know. Yeah. No, I took Spanish and Russian in school. Oh, okay, good. Good for you. Hi, Nicholas. Hi, everyone. Hello. We'll so we had, a, we had a brief power outage about... 10 minutes ago, so uh, we've got storms in the area, so just, just be forewarned. All right, well, you know, we'll, we'll be flexible. If you drop out, we'll just hang out until you come back on. Right. Not a big deal. Might take, might take five minutes for the things to reboot. I'm sure we can have a conversation about something. Hi, Joshua. Hey, what's going on, guys? How are we doing this evening? Good, you? I'm here and not at work, which is a good situation. Now you're that. Yeah.
All right, we'll give another two minutes because we're not officially at five Pacific. Um, I was telling Stanley that a couple of us in the, the leadership of the society are rehashing um, or, or hashing out if we're going to modify our the society's vision statement and mission, um, mm. try to realign. Uh, so you're all welcome to you know email me your thoughts on that uh, or attend the meetings if you want. Oh, oh here, here's a minor question. I'm just curious. Why do you announce the times in Pacific time? Because I'm in L.A. Well, it should be Greenwich Mean Time, I think. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 that's always, right. Oh, oh, I didn't know you were on yeah. the West Coast. Yeah, I'm on the West Coast. Yeah, yeah that, oh, we that, can do that, Moscow always, time. Oh, okay. I always talk in the time zone I'm in. Yeah, no, yeah. no, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, when I first moved out here, I, I had trouble converting from East Coast to Pacific. I kept screwing up the time. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to do it all in Pacific now, and it's on everybody else to figure it out. Yeah. Well, oh, uh, the yeah. calendar's figured out for us, so we don't have to yeah. worry about it. I mean, certainly people who are interested in the moon can figure out, you know, we can work back and forth with different time zones. So, you would hope yeah, so. Maybe, maybe. Like, even we're capable of doing that. But, but, not, but not dimensional units, right? Uh, that's still a challenge sometimes. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, well, welcome everyone. Let's, uh, it's five o'clock, so let's just get this thing started. Uh, I have housekeeping, so I am going uh, all right, everybody see that? Oh yeah. Uh, slideshow from the beginning. There we go. All right. Welcome to the August virtual meeting for Mare Cognitum. Uh, I'm Ben Smith, I'm chapter lead. So, agenda today, same thing as last month. Exciting news, volunteer opportunities, we're gonna do a presentation. Dallas is gonna to talk to us about orbital propellant depots, is that it? That's, that's correct, propellant depots. Excellent. Uh, then afterwards, we're going to have Q&A and discussion about the topic or, you know, anything. And then again, we'll, we'll save a little time if we want to talk about what we could do as a chapter, like a project or a workshop or something to get everybody involved to do something. That's optional. And as always, contact me at this address if you, uh, you get questions or comments or whatever. So, society news. We had our annual elections. James Burke was re-elected as vice president. Uh, I'm now the treasurer. My seat came up, so there was three seats. Uh, Dana Carson, who was the previous treasurer, is now on the board of directors. Uh, James Golston re retained his seat, and Inara Tabir is a, a new member, and she is also on the board of directors. Oh, and I forgot to put it on this, but uh, we had board meeting last night, and she was also elected to chair of the board. All right, we also had our annual meeting last week. Uh, for those of you who couldn't attend, the, the video is on our YouTube channel. Um, James Burke presented Michael Mealing, our president's um, report to the to the membership because uh, Michael was I believe on a train at the time and lost internet or something. Basically it was a state of the society and where we're going. So if you're interested in that video is on the YouTube channel. And uh, James Burke has been working very hard and I believe he has all the presentations from last month's Lunar Development Conference also on the YouTube channel. So make sure you take a look at those. Leadership and volunteer opportunities. This is gonna be a monthly thing. We have lots and lots of opportunities and not enough bodies to fill them. So this month, I am going to highlight the marketing and communications coordinator, which basically would also include social media. Uh, one of the things we've been talking about 
in the leadership is that we really need to do a better job of marketing, marketing the society, marketing, you know, our products, marketing conferences and you know, all the stuff that we do. Um, so we really need somebody in that position who's going to spend some time and actually figure out a marketing plan and implement it and, you know, massage the, the social media and all that other stuff. And then, uh, once again, Mari Cognitum could use some help. Uh, yeah, I'm a one-man show at the moment. If you want to help me find speakers or, you know, put stuff together or whatever, just let me know. And, of course, we have all the other things listed here and more. It's all on the website. We have a, a page for volunteer. Uh, plenty of information there. Any questions or comments about any of this? Yeah, Ben, in chat, it looked like one person was volunteering. I think Evan for publications. Let's see. Evan, Evan publications. Carabolos. Yep. Um, contact me. Uh, publications coordinator, I'm not 100% certain what that would involve. I know we have several books that we've published. Uh, another one's in the works, it's being edited. So you can contact me, although I think maybe contacting James Burke would probably give you better information because that's who I would go to to find out anyway. So Evan, just uh, if, you're, if you're in Slack, just message James Burke and say, hey, I'm interested in doing the, the publications coordinator or helping with publications and he can help hook you up. Nicholas, there is no speaker for next month. I am trying to find uh, trying to find somebody. If somebody wants to speak, it's open. Uh, Michael Lane, who helped coordinate our Lunar Development Conference, is going to help find speakers. Um, Nicholas, if you want to present, you are more than welcome to present. I will put you on the calendar. Hey, I'd, I'd prefer the October slot, if that's good. You what? I'd prefer the October slot, if that's fine. The October slot? Yeah, let me... Um, it was, was empty last I look. Let me find my pencil and doodle that down. And I'll do that later. I, I, have, a, I have an old presentation, but I thought I'd uh, uh, put some effort into putting something that's less than 10 years old. Well, you know, if it's, if it's still relevant, yeah, <laughs> oh, I think I think it is, but uh, I still would like to uh, uh, decide a bit on what, what direction I'm heading, not just talk about what I did ten years ago. Okay, well we can uh, I can pencil I can put you on the the list for October, and we can figure out what the topic will be. Yep, um, that's good. Still, still need a uh, September. Um, actually, hold on, let me. Let me check. What is the date for September again? I'm I'm looking it up now. Yeah, I've got to. I want to check something. Because uh, I had, I think I have. All right. Yeah, I got Daryl for November. Okay, the September one is the sixteenth. So yeah, if we have a September, if I can find somebody for September, Nicholas could do October. I've got Daryl Preble already for November and we'll just keep rolling. So if you want to present, let me know and we'll uh, get you a slot. Yeah, I could actually do September, not October. I'll be gone during the October one. But I could do I could do September. I I um I could actually drop the basic the, the kernel of my talk into the chat right here and people can you know give me some feedback on it and then I can present next week or whatever you like yeah sure yeah I'll do that right now um send me an email we can coordinate it um yeah that'd be great I'll email you cool okay that'll be great uh let's see Evis what do you need for the Artemis team I have no idea uh I uh so for those of you who don't know the backstory, the um, 
the Moon Society was born out of the Lunar Resource Company. Um, the Lunar Reclamation Society, I believe. <laughs> no, no, it was TLRC. Oh, so no. Lunar oh, Resource okay. Company. Yep. It was, it was founded back in the 90s. It was going to create, it was actually, their, their goal was to create a base. They were going to bend metal, create a base. But in 2000, they decided they needed to spin off a nonprofit arm. So that was the Moon Society. Well, TLRC went defunct um, for many, many, many years. It just lay dormant. Well, two years ago, we bought out the shareholders, and now the Moon Society owns all the intellectual property of TLRC and all its accounts and everything. So um, the thought is, is that we need somebody to revive it if you want to. I mean, all the information is very old. I mean, the project used the space shuttle to launch stuff. That's how old it is. Um, so everything would have to be looked at again, reworked for new technology and new situations. But it's, uh, it's a project waiting for a leader. And there are other people in the society that know way more about it than I do. So again, get into Slack, ask about it. People that know more will be happy to tell you everything they know. I kind of uh, recall that from, the, from, from uh, history. I think they had some two man, two person landers and stuff and open, they open did. landers. With yeah. open concept, there's yeah. spacesuits, seats and vacuum. And a framework, yeah, kind of yeah. like a motorcycle. Yeah. Yep, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it was a uh, it was a bit different. I'm not sure how practical it would have been, but it was a it was an interesting concept. Right. Uh, let's see. Burke is technically yeah he, he is Burke uh, is in charge of Lunar City Press. And uh, yep, you can just just email me and we'll we'll talk about that. And then the tasks for the art again. There are, there are no tasks, there is no leader. We have somebody who said that they were gonna revive it, but nothing happened. So hmm. that is waiting for somebody to take over. As is most of the, uh, the projects for the society. We got lots of ideas, but not enough people to go to actually do the work. So that is the, the, the perpetual problem. All right, anybody have anything else? If not, tonight's presentation, In Space Propellant Depots, presented by Dallas Beanhoff, founder of, oh crap. Uh, I do not want to end a slide. Founder of Black Sky. Thank you. Cool company name, I like it, Dallas. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, take it away, Dallas. Oh, okay, if you insist. Well, it's either that or I just vamp for the next, you know, 50 minutes. Right. So <laughs> please take it away. Let's see. Oh, I don't want to, I don't want to do that yet. There we go. Come on, there we go. How's that? That looks good. So, so this is this is a, a talk that or a presentation or set of slides that I used with Conversations for the Future a couple of weeks ago, and uh, it was more a it was a panel rather than just me talking. So I've included other uh, slides in here as well. So uh, you get to see what we talked about uh, for for an hour. Uh, I'll take as little or as much time as you want based on questions. If you have questions, um, ask them at any time. Interrupt me if you can. And uh, just a little more background besides before founding CSDC, I was project manager and, and uh, capture team lead at the Boeing company for uh, human and commercial space, space missions did uh, depot studies, did architecture studies, uh, Mars mission studies, uh, lunar mission studies, Mars or lunar habitat studies, uh, a lot of transportation architecture, exploration architecture studies over the course of my year. 
uh, X33 uh, systems engineer for, for Rockwell, uh, worked on space station and in the inter in the Russian integration team, um, helped develop the space shuttle main engine, um, started my career making drawing changes on Mylar at Martin Marietta for the Titan III payload interface plane. So that, that, that kind of dates me. But the most fun I had was going to college in Florida, watching the Saturn Vs go to the moon from the coastline live. So I, I watched most of the, of the Apollo launches. So that was cool. So what I'm gonna share with you and, and, and hopefully you'll have questions, comments, criticisms is uh, a story about in space propellant depots. Uh, start with what may be a precursor to depots and then show a bunch of pictures and more pictures and more pictures of, of depot studies or depot concepts. Uh, talk about the depot impact, uh, what types of depots there are, uh, and the functional capabilities that depots might have and must have, and where they might be located, and then, and then bring in the, the other panel participants' information as well after, after talking about locations. So ULA, a few years ago, when they, when they were first starting the Vulcan story, uh, put forth the concept known as distributed launch. And basically, I would call this just-in-time refueling where you have a space-based stage, whether you launch it just before the propellant or whether it comes back from the mission and is waiting for the next mission, you launch a tanker up to refuel that stage to do the next mission. And that tanker may also include the payload that it would push to the next mission. Uh, you know, they, they pursued this uh, basically until uh, their parent companies told them to stop talking about things like this, uh, which was prevalent in the 2010s to 2015 timeframe. Um, talking about depots almost cost me my job at that, in that timeframe, just after Boeing was awarded the Space Launch System contract. Uh, so, but, but this is a way that that uh, we can extend the reach of existing stages with minor modifications. Uh, basically, it allows one to increase the payload capacity to any destination by a factor of two to three over, over a current mission using a single launch and that same upper stage. So this, this could be a precursor. And, and in the architecture that CSDC has defined, uh, from low Earth orbit to the moon, we actually can do just-in-time refueling. We have a reusable Earth to orbit tanker to refuel our depot or to replenish propellants in, an upper, in, a, in a reusable upper stage. But depot studies go way back to the 70s and perhaps all the way back to Werner von Braun and the uh, Mission to Mars uh, story. Uh, you can see here uh, a toroidal depot, uh, a hydrogen depots of, of all kinds being serviced by uh, space shuttle concepts. Uh, this was probably, you know, this was pre uh, space shuttle space transportation system uh, award. And, and these were going to many places uh, to support operations in Earth orbit, going to the moon and going out to Mars. And, and even more depots, ESA has a, has a, had a study on depots. That's a big one in the middle. Uh, I'm not sure what this propellant depot is, but again, it's a square concept. I don't know. Uh, maybe that's just the protection from meteoroids, micrometeoroids and, and for insulation. It could very well be a, a stretched centaur. Here we have a centaur and Orion uh, as a way to get the Orion out to, uh, out to the moon or elsewhere, a, a multi-tank depot, um, maybe spin stabilized, maybe not. And then there was a story in the Houston Chronicle uh, about the time of, of space launch system or constellation about depots. And this, this uh, pulled on the ULA concept of a sunshade around a centaur well, with passive uh, refueling. So these are probably, uh, 
16 to 20,000 ton or kilogram uh, centaurs stacked on a on a, um, a structural truss uh, waiting to to refuel a, a vehicle going out to the moon. And, and even more, uh, this concept on the upper left comes from the cryogenic propellant storage and transfer demonstration mission concept studies, CPST for short. Uh, five companies, Boeing included, which the study I led and proposed was to demonstrate the technologies needed for propellant depots, propellant transfer, passive, passive thermal management, active thermal management, uh, cryogenic propellant transfer, uh, zero, zero bubble transfer, um, pressurization and pressure control. And, and to be on orbit for as long as we could with the propellant we would launch. Uh, that uh, study had a, a price goal of, of 200 million to launch and fly and build uh, with an upper limit of 300 with, uh, for, for uh, supportable reasons. Uh, we, Boeing, came in with that, uh, within that price range NASA took it in-house and the price grew to over a billion dollars and was reformulated into a ground demonstration mission continuation only. It has yet to fly and, and probably won't. This lower one is Orbit Fab's concept for uh, basically small sat refueling or CubeSat refueling. Those are CubeSats on a structural truss. Uh, refueling a customer with water or some other green storable propellant. Uh, the one in the upper right is, I think, a notional concept from either, um, was it Kerbal, Kerbal Space? Not Kermit Space. Uh, but uh, the two in the lower corners are from the study I did at Boeing on, on uh, supporting Constellation with the depot. And this is the constellation exploration up or Earth departure stage, it was called. And these were six Delta IV heavy upper stages that it would take to replenish the propellant it used to get to orbit and to put propellant in the lunar lander. Uh, with that capability and changing the burn from which vehicle, i.e., the Earth departure stage only did TLI, but if you refilled it, it could do the TLI and the lunar orbit insertion, and one had a full propellant tank in lunar orbit in the lander. The landed mass on the moon could be increased from 18 tons to 53 to 51 tons, which that additional 33 tons would be payload as opposed to just the asset module and a couple of tons of payload for the surface activities. So quite an impact on the landed mass if one, if one refueled that. Um, and then th these are the ways to refuel the uh, tanks from, these are this is a reusable earth to orbit tanker. And this is a reusable earth to orbit or, or reusable stage uh, for, uh, uh, orbit transfer, and also the basis for the depot. This is the ULA concept uh, for ACES, uh, Advanced Cryogenic Exploration Stage with passive, a passive uh, sunshade to protect it from direct sunlight. And this is the Centaur upper stage or the, the, the ACES upper stage launched on an on a Atlas V uh, heavy. Uh, the one in the upper right is, those are ice, blocks of ice wrapped around a core as a, as a depot. So solid, a solid depot, solid propellant depot that would then be melted and transferred into the, uh, the transfer stage. I'm not sure where this one comes from. Uh, I, it may come from John Strickland's book. I think that artist, Nestorova, is the artist he used for his book, uh, on, on propellant depots or, or, or uh, for the National Space Society. But again, these are, this is a passive, deep, passive cooling concept. This is the interface for, for multiple tanks. 
And these are basically from the 2010s. And even more, I mean, even more. There, there, are, there are tons of these. The, these are lower ones are from John Strickland's book, uh, as is the Mars one. We've got space or Starship, SpaceX Starship over here, transferring vehicle to vehicle. Uh, a, another notional concept, uh, not sure who that's from. Uh, I've got all the reference links in the back of this briefing. Um, but there, there are just so many different concepts and types of depots uh, that people have put out there either as just artwork or as, as um, really thought out concepts. And then these are, these are the Cislunar uh, Space Development Company depot concepts in Earth orbit, Earth, Moon, L1, and maybe even Mars. These are water to cryo depots. So we ship up water, we electrolyze it, we liquefy it, and we fill our, our space tugs uh, to service GEO, GTO, and Earth, Moon, L1 from low Earth orbit. And then at L1, we service our moon, our moon shuttle to take 25 tons down to the moon as a payload. And again, that's water. So we can ship water back and forth up, up to Earth orbit, back and forth to the moon, uh, to L1, up from the moon to L1. And if it's cheap enough, if water is cheap enough on the moon, maybe even all the way back to Earth orbit. Uh, but that cost relative to getting to Earth orbit has to be on the order of a tenth of, of the cost of uh, getting to Earth orbit. The cost of water on the moon has to be about a tenth of getting it from Earth orbit. And then at Mars, uh, the Mars idea basically comes from Lockheed Martin's Red Rock concept and their, and their Mars camp, where they had a reusable Mars descent ascent vehicle that used LOX hydrogen and it needed about 80 tons to go round trip from orbit to the surface and back up. And uh, they talked about shipping water out to, out to the Mars orbit as opposed to cryogenic propellants to avoid boil off. And so this would help, do, this would do that. Uh, the power required here, uh, these are 500 kilowatt arrays, five times the space station power load, power supply to support up to 100 tons a month of propellant production. So what's the impact of depots on space transportation? Like I said, uh, up to two to three times more payload uh, for, to destinations beyond low Earth orbit with the same uh, current vehicles that put things into TLI or, or GTO, geotransfer orbit, like the Centaur. Uh, the the uh, Atlas V, the Atlas IV, the uh, Centaur, the Vulcan, uh, Delta Heavy. Uh, I talked about the 33-ton increase in landed mass for constellations Altair. We can really limit any upper stage to about 5,000 meters per second of Delta V for a specific payload. Uh, and that gets you almost anywhere on a, on a um, sub-leg of a, of, a of a trip to the moon or to Mars. And if you transfer then to go down into a lander on a different vehicle, everything can be less than 5,000 meters per second from a delta V capacity, which, which limits the um, process of carrying propellant to burn propellant on your way back home. Uh, it, they can be a support base for uh, reasonable transfer vehicles and landers. You know, the vehicles can dock at the depot and, and be passive and let the depot control their, their orbit and attitude, et cetera, uh, between missions. Uh, like our, our propellant depots, they can produce locks, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen from water. So it's easier to transport water uh, than it is locks hydrogen. Denser, uh, doesn't boil off. You have to keep it from freezing. And, and all of the mission hardware can be launched separately from the propellant. Uh, you know, 80% of what we launch into orbit, launch into space, is propellant. So one can take a, a geosatellite that today we launch into geotransfer orbit, six-ton spacecraft, three of which is propellant if it's not electric. We launch it on a 20-ton launch vehicle. Get the propellant off of there 
get the propulsion system off of there for transfer, for circularization, launch that same satellite capability on a Firefly Beta or smaller, 4,000 kilogram launch vehicle made up with a tug in low earth orbit that gets its propellant from the depot and send it out. One should be able to do that for less cost than the, the heavy launch vehicles and the cost of the propulsion system in the spacecraft. Uh, especially if we can get uh, propellant to orbit on the uh, Starship. And, and there's talk of a strategic propellant reserve in orbit. Tori Bruno at ULA has talked about this uh, and has promoted a grandiose architecture to do that that encompasses the um, lunar surface mining operations and getting propellant from the moon to Earth orbit on, for, for a cost in the order of 25 to $30 billion. If one focused just on the propellant reserve aspect of this, that could be had for a tenth or less of what Tori's talking about. Two billion, a billion, 500K, uh, maybe 50K annually, maybe, maybe 100K annually. And you'd, one could have a strategic propellant reserve just by asking a commercial depot owner to increase the capacity of their depot. One could put more depots up and spend more money in different orbits, but a strategic propellant reserve can be had for a lot less than a billion dollars. Dallas, I've got a question. Yes, sir. Um, so the focus is primarily on water, locks, and liquid hydrogen, right? There's no, there's nobody's really looking at alternate fuels. Uh, people are looking at alternate fuels. CSDC does not. Um, I'm sorry, CSDC favor, favors water and locks hydrogen because water is everywhere in the solar system. And you, you, can't, you can't produce methane in some places. So you have to take the methane with you. Some people are using methane. Uh, yeah, we, would gladly, we would gladly put methane tanks on our depots and transfer methane to those who want it. Do you know of anybody who's working on like, um, like um, metal liquid oxygen engines or depots? Something that could be, you know, mined off the moon without using the, the hydrogen? I, I don't know anybody that's doing that. I have read of, um, this, is, this is, gosh, back in the 70s or 80s, I think, about uh, silane engines. SiO4, I think it is. Um, uh, it, but the, the, the combustion products is sand, silicon dioxide. You know, um, there are uh, obviously the electric engines, uh, there are uh, ion engines, there are iodine engines for low thrust, uh, there are uh, metallic fuels for, for electric engines. Uh, but but they, they don't require that much propellant. Argon, xenon also. Uh, uh, we, we focused on LOX hydrogen again because water is everywhere. It's the highest ISP, the least amount of propellant by mass. Propellant is the cost, is the price driver of any service that's doing uh, space transportation. And uh, you, you get you get you use a li the least amount of propellant using LOX hydrogen. Right. You know, there's over a hundred seconds difference between uh, LOX hydrogen and LOX methane. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. So I like LOX hydrogen. We handle it all the time on space shuttle. We fly it all the time. Uh, the 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 ding about boil off for hydrogen is really because the stages we operate today are not designed for long duration in space. They're designed for a quick boost to orbit, a quarter revolution uh, duration to get to uh, uh, the equator and a burn to GTO and then thrown away. Right. So, so they, don't have to, they don't have to hold hydrogen for a long time or oxygen. So they don't have the insulation. They don't, so, so they have 
high boil off rates. We don't have to have high boil off rates. We don't have to have any boil off. And I'll talk about that, I think, at the end. Um, Ad libbing. Yeah. So, uh, like, like the pictures I, I walked through, there are multiple depot concepts. You know, there are different propellant combinations and states, storable biprops. You know, look what Orbit Fab is doing. Water, look what Orbit Fab is doing. Uh, Tether, Tethers Unlimited has a, and, and Bradford have a water thruster. Uh, Momentus uses water in their thrusters. Uh, the Ice Depot. Uh, Cryogenics, big fan here. Water to cry out, bigger fan. Uh, different gravitational configurations, microgravity. A gravity gradient configuration where, where the, the, the depot naturally orients in a radial direction relative to Earth, Earth's center, and the, and the propellant settles because of the gravity gradient. Uh, rotating the depot to get artificial gravity. Uh, magnetic settling. Uh, this is all to avoid getting ga gas the, um, into, the, into the fluid lines when you're trying to transfer liquid. Uh, but there are mechanical devices that allow us to, to keep the, the gas phase out of the liquid transfer process. And then there are different thermal management approaches. Active heating, cryo coolers, or not active heating, cryo coolers, active heating heaters to keep stuff from freezing. Passive cooling, where there is some boil off and uh, some will claim that's an advantage because they will use that boil off for attitude control. So they say they're not really losing it, um, but you still have to collect it. Active cooling, which is the cryo coolers, uh, which eliminates boil off, and then liquefaction, which is taking water to gaseous oxygen and gaseous hydrogen, and then liquefying it so you don't have to transfer the cryogenics. So depot functional capabilities, what must depots do in order to be successful? Uh, the red letters are kind of a, a minimum for a depot to operate. It has to receive propellant, store propellant, it has to dispense propellant. It has to keep it cool or keep it hot, depending on the fluids. Uh, from CSDC standpoint, we need to produce uh, oxygen and hydrogen, remove the water from the hydrogen, because when we electrolyze water, some of that water does not get electrolyzed. It comes out of the system as steam with the hydrogen. So we have to get rid of that water before we liquefy it. So we have to liquefy it after that. But in addition, they also need the, the basic satellite functions uh, to stay in orbit, to, st to know where they are and to hold up the tanks, primary structure, power generation, storage, lots of power, thermal management, command and control, guidance, navigation, and control, communications, command and data handling. So, so they're, they're, uh, they're quite a big deal and, and they can be pretty massive. The depots that that I showed you from CSDC, uh, those capacities, they have about 150 ton capacity of water and 150 ton capacity of oxygen and hydrogen. And they may be eventually in multiple locations. They could be in multiple Earth orbits. My primary location is due east out of Kennedy Space Center, 28 and a half degrees because the most propellant is used getting to geo and obviously going to, the, going to the moon. For the US, that's going out of Kennedy, going up to 20 and a half and then going from there. It doesn't make sense to me to have depots to refuel satellites that are in multiple Earth orbits, different inclinations, different, uh, uh, angles of, of ascending nodes, different, uh, different uh, uh, polar orbits, uh, multiple sun sink orbits, etc. But, but there could be depots there. Earth Moon L1 and L2. I'm a fan of L1 because it's between the Earth and the Moon. Others are a fan of L2 because it takes less delta V to get to L2 than to L1 a little bit. Uh, 
NASA is a fan of Gateway NRHO because that's where Orion can get to. And so that all the HLS, the human landing system concepts have to go to the moon from the gateway or the gateway orbit. And so we worked with uh, a couple of the companies, Dynetics and Space and, Spa and uh, Space Blue Origin to conceive depots that, that would service their landers at the gateway and, and keep propellant there and, and, and told them what it might cost them. Uh, there might be a depot in low lunar orbit. Uh, not a fan of that because of the, the instability of those orbits. Uh, also, it, to me, if we are going to the moon, we should be able to go anywhere on the moon. And going into lunar orbit is going to uh, restrict that either in location without a lot of delta V or in time without a lot of delta V if you want to leave at any time or, or go at any time because of the way it would uh, rotate around the moon. Could be uh, obviously on the lunar surface. This is, a, this is a picture from a study by college students under a program where I was one of the judges. And, uh, and one of the years that the, the theme, one of the themes was to define a, an architecture on the moon to produce 100 tons a year of water and, and convert that to propellant. So this is a, a 100 ton per year propellant production facility on the moon. Uh, they could be in Mars orbit, like I showed, and they could be on the Mars surface, which is what Elon or SpaceX will need for their starship, because when it gets to, to Mars surface, it's empty. So in order to come back home, you got to fill it. And, and then on, uh, in Mars orbit, which was part of the Mars base camp concept from Lockheed Martin. And I believe that depots are a necessary infrastructure for a true space economy. You know, they are infrastructure because they remain in a defined orbit. So they're not fixed like the gas station on the corner, but they are in a defined orbit. And, and you know where to go and, and, and there they are. And, and they don't move around, they're there. Uh, they refill transportation vehicles. So do they refuel them, do they gas them, to, do they top them off? You know, are they spaceports? Are they gas stations? Are they filling stations? Are they what? What are they? Are they depots? You know, what's a term that the common person can understand? You know, we, we like to create words for what we create. So right now they're propellant depots. Now, at one point uh, at a conference, uh, in a conversation, the term gasteroids came, came up. Now that's not a, a, a term that I would like to throw around, but you know, there are asteroids with gas stations on them, right? Sounds too much like hemorrhoids to me. So I would avoid that. Uh, they're cross docking facilities. Uh, cross docking facilities are where the semis come in to a local community, offload their cargo, that gets off onloaded into smaller vehicles as they go around to different locations in the metropolitan area to deliver the goods on the various sites. So, and, and this is where we, CSDC, transfers payloads from our space tugs to our moon shuttle, from our launch customer to our space tugs, you know. And they could also be a host for payloads, i.e. instruments looking out or looking down, and for spacecraft that haven't, have yet to be deployed. You know, maybe these are redundant spares in orbit uh, that are, either go into geo or gto or or some other uh, orbit that can be reached from the depot location and part of the conversation george sowers was on the panel last, uh, two weeks ago and and this is the uh concept from the ula cis lunar 1000 where they talked about having a thousand people in space by 2030 and the routes that they were looking at for propellant uh, sourcing and delivery and missions uh, using depots. So uh, they were ser servicing, uh, servicing the geo market from L1. They were, they were servicing L1 from LEO, uh, servicing L1 from the moon, uh, servicing uh, L1 from near Earth asteroids and, and also out to Earth, Moon, L2. And the, 
the storyline goes, if there's water on the moon, and if water is less expensive from the moon to your destination than propellant from Earth to your destination, then we should be shipping and using water as propellants, even in our geosatellites, and use these water thrusters for station keeping. And now you've got a true water economy service from space sourced propellants. Uh, George at Colorado School of Mines also uh, did a study for, for the, uh, the Space Force and looked at, at what a depot, I looked at a depot concept at Earth Moon L1. And this depot, these are water tanks. These are propellant tanks, cryo tanks. This is a sunshade. So passive, passive cooling, not, not uh, cryo coolers to avoid boil off because they use the boil off for attitude control and station keeping. These are servicing bays or, or, or docking stations for servicing spacecraft. And this little module here is the electrolyzer and liquefier. And, and my comment to George was, hey, George, if you have a liquefier, why do you have passive cooling and boil off? route that gas back to liquefier and send it back as liquid. Don't lose that. And if you wanna use gaseous oxygen and hydrogen for attitude control, tap it off your electrolyzer and pressurize it and now you've got that source. So many ways to do this. Another look at this, uh, they spun the tanks for settling so they didn't have zero G or microgravity acquisition devices in their tanks, they spun them. So now you've got a rotating structure in space. These are the servicing bays, whether that was for a spacecraft or you could bring stuff in to be repaired by and protected from the sun and radiation and, and, and meteoroids. Um, key technologies, passive cryogenic storage, sunshade and MLI, uh, no vent transfer. They've demonstrated this on the ground with, with uh, NASA KSC. Uh, water purification, uh, I, I would send pure water or send the water I need, uh, electrolyze it and liquefy it. Then they had fuel cells to get energy and water back as well. So they don't have solar arrays on this. So they get all their power from fuel cells, which is a, I don't want to say a losing proposition, but it takes more energy uh, to get oxygen and hydrogen than you get from producing water from oxygen and hydrogen. So, you know, it's kind of a, it's a losing energy proposition. Um, more key tech, it's a key tech lines. And then he talked about the geo belt servicing, which is getting in the long run, replacing propulsion systems and geo with water systems as opposed to hypergolic or even um, the current electric hull thrusters and xenon and use water instead. And there are plasma thrusters or there are steam thrusters, uh, uh, two or three different kinds of, of water thrusters that could be used for station keeping. Dave Chevron was also part of that discussion. And, and back in the uh, early 2000s, mid 2000s, they, he was part of a study that looked at the evolution of depots looks very similar to the Cislunar 1000 concept, excuse me, where they started in LEO with a depot and then grew it out to GEO and then to L1 and then finally serviced it from the moon. Um, and, and again, it, it's infrastructure that's being built. It's, it's, the whole, it's the whole capability of getting water from the moon and, and, and turning that into propellant. From, from a CSDC standpoint, we're transportation and we would, we would buy propellant or have propellant launched from Earth or buy, have water launched from Earth and buy the same on the moon when and if it's ever cheaper than we can get it there or, where, or, or get it to our needed destinations uh, from, from a, a, a moon producer. So we're separating, we, we separate out some, uh, some of these functions into other parties and, and, and that makes the, investment required less to make this whole thing happen. 
And so therefore the architecture has to operate, our architecture has to operate throughout cislunar space being serviced from Earth from the get-go. And when propellant becomes available on the moon for less, then our capability increases. Uh, Edgar Zapata from, from uh, retired from KSC or semi-retired, uh, also was part of a study or, or promoted a concept uh, that used depots instead of a space launch system to get to the moon. And, and basically it was taking that just-in-time refueling concept, uh, applying it to the Earth to orbit and TLI leg, and then from TLI, translunar injection, on out to the moon, it looked very much like Apollo. So he, re he basically told the story of replacing heavy lift with frequent propellant launch to refill the stages, one, the, the translunar injection stage, and maybe even the lunar insertion stage with propellant, with uh, propellant launches rather than launching them all in a single, in a single mission. And you can look for, for his work on the web conversation at Edgar Zapata. He has a website where he talks about this stuff. Um, let's see, I'm looking for, uh, th this is from Conversations for the Future, but he does have a website. So look up Edgar Zapata and, and he's got lots of, of uh, white papers on, on propellant depots and, and other subjects. It looks like uh, at the bottom of that, the lower left has got his website, Zapata, right there, yep. Oh yeah, Zapata, I, I was thrown off by the NASA. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Because yeah, I know he's no longer there, but yeah, ZapataTalksNASA.com. Thank you. Uh, so th this is this slide, this, this graphic is sideways because it's huge. I have one on my wall downstairs at the, the next iteration that is probably five feet tall and two and a half feet wide. This was started at Rockwell back in 19, 1980, 1990 timeframe. Uh, by a couple of colleagues uh, during the uh, space exploration initiative days. And this is a roadmap of what needs to be done to move humanity out into space over the next hundred years. And so you can go to this website, www.quora.com. What could a space program achieve today if it started to receive Apollo levels of funding again? Uh, or, or you could just look up integrated space plane on Google and it'll take you to that site. Uh, this is an interesting look at what we were thinking in the late 80s, early 90s on how we would get to become a space civilization. Uh, there's a later version that, that I think is, is a little less cluttered, but also a little less um, enlightening, if you will. Uh, but uh, integratedspaceplane.com, you can look at the various iterations. Uh, the first one was all black and white, so these colored bubbles weren't, weren't there. But um, this was a, 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 uh, an effort of painstaking detail by Ron Jones and Jonathan B. Post at Rockwell uh, in the 80s. And they were doing this on... on um, the early Max, I forget what they were called. You know the little the little uh, bread box sized Mac Macintoshes, um, and and we didn't have huge printers and stuff. So um, anyway, so some questions that we talked about uh, during the the panel. Uh, you know what are the similarities and differences between stage refueling and propellant depots. Um, you know, uh, to me, just in time refueling, i.e. refueling a stage before you leave, puts that propellant launch in the critical path and therefore the mission probability of success path. If you have a depot, you take that propellant launch out of that mission probability of success and you just have a propellant transfer function. So, you know, SpaceX, the Starship can take up to 12, Starship launches to refill its tanks in Earth orbit. 
if it's refueling from the tanker to the transfer vehicle, you know, that's 13 flights that have to be successful before you can leave. If it's into a tanker that then fills the transfer vehicle, then you can schedule 14 or 15 flights and always ensure that you have a full propellant load before you launch your transfer vehicle or, or start to, that transfer process. And it changes the probability of mission success significantly. Um, industrial base, supply chain, workforce, you know, the, these uh, are, were, were thoughts for the, the conversation of the future. Why don't we have depots today? You know, um, several, several reasons. Uh, we like to do big rockets, number one. Um, the uh, study by uh, NASA during or prior to Constellation, when it wasn't called, yet called Constellation, was dockings and, and uh, multiple launches reduce the probability of success, and, and therefore uh, depots would, would reduce the probability of success of the mission. Uh, should there be a depot associated with every launch site? You know, to me, every launch site, you know, the best, the best orbit to go into is due east. Maybe there should be a depot tied to every launch site. And then they can all get to L1 and then they can all get down to the moon at any time they want or off to Mars. Uh, are there good locations and bad locations for depots? Uh, to me, uh, sun sink orbits, because there are so many different orientations of sun sink orbits, i.e. the time it flies over a given spot, you know, it takes a lot of energy to transfer between, to, to change those orbit planes. So, you know, sun sink is probably not a good place, nor is any other orbit uh, when, you, when you have a constellation of, of different planes, you know, unless, unless you're, you have a depot in every plane, to service just the spacecraft in that plane. And that, now you've got a huge capital expense to put those depots up. Um, so to me, the best place is on the path where there's a lot of traffic, like go into GEO, go into GTO, go into the moon. Um, so uh, re refueling or assembly or both. I'm not sure what I meant by that, but perhaps it's... Uh, are, are we refueling the vehicles or are we assembling the vehicles by, by stacking stages together? And if you look at the Mars Reference Mission 5, uh, there was a lot of launching of propellant tanks to be assembled into the, trans, the departure vehicles uh, before the mission could start. And so some of the concepts had uh, three, five, seven, up to seven, I think, propellant tanks that were launched in addition to the habitat, the structure, uh, the lander, et cetera. And so it took over two years to, to assemble the spacecraft to go to Mars. Um, uh, let's see, yes, the questions. So I'm gonna stop talking and, and one of the things that, uh, not stop talking, stop sharing. Um, the thing about propellant depots that people talk about talk against them are propellant boil off, hydrogen is too hard to handle, we'll use LOX methane instead because they're the same temperature, uh, and um, other, other, other things. But there are cryo coolers that, are, that NASA has been ground testing for oxygen and hydrogen to eliminate boil off. And they're capable of, of liquefying propellant of oxygen and hydrogen. So if we have cryo coolers on board depots because we're producing liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, there should be no boil off. And if we're just intercepting the heat after we've wrapped the, the tanks in, in uh, effective multi-layer insulation, the heat load isn't so bad that we can put a cryo cooler on to eliminate the boil off even on transfer on tankers and, and space tugs. And, and not have a significant impact on their mass. Uh, so, so I like LOX hydrogen because LOX hydrogen is the most efficient propellant today, chemical propellant. I'm not a, a, I'm less of a fan of nuclear thermal even though it has twice the specific impulse, 
but it doesn't have as great an advantage from an ISRU standpoint. You mine all that water, you throw all that oxygen away. You can't breathe that much oxygen. You can't put enough people on the moon to breathe that much oxygen as we need for, for using hydrogen only to get around the solar system. So uh, the technology is there. The technology has to be flown in space yet to demonstrate it. Um, but we were going to do that in 2011 and 12, and here we are not having done it yet, uh, which is a real shame. I'll stop. And I'll stop. <laughs> I was going to ask. So, so um, where are we, you know, readiness level wise with this? I mean, is it just that we we just need to throw a little more money at it and we can start building, or does it need more research? Where are we at this? I think I think most of most everything we need can be TRL six or five today, which means it needs to go to space to take that next level. Okay, so we we've built out you know ground prototypes, we've tested them. We just need to fly some stuff now to get some data. Right, right. Okay, and that's basically a function of money at this point. Well, you know. I would, I would, I would opine that we could build a an, an easy depot like we saw from the CPST study, or or take a, a Delta IV heavy upper stage or a Centaur upper stage. I don't like the, the common bulkhead, but and, and we could put we could outfit it with the technologies and put it in space. And it could be a prototype space tug. Mm -hmm. It could be an operational space tug as we learn how these things operate in space, you know, and, and, and use it to what it can do rather than design it for a specific mission and force it to do that mission. You know, let's, let's put something together, right. call it a proto flight, proto flight unit, and fly it and use it. So not just, be not just demonstrate it. So would that be something that NASA should do? Should a no. private company do that? I think I think I think uh, I think that is a a private industry opportunity, which is why we're do why we're defining the requirements for that. Why we're why we've defined our architecture. Uh, all we need is money. That's whatever. Just give me a billion dollars, and I'll create you a miracle. I don't. Sure. Know. <laughs> it, yeah, it's a. Uh, it seems like there's kind of a chicken and an egg problem here, where if we had this capability, then customers would probably use it. But, you know, no one's developing the capability because they think that there aren't customers out there asking for it and ready to pay for it right now. But what do you think about Northrop Grumman's MEV-1 and MEV-2? I mean, those are space tugs, right? Um, yes and no. Those are, those are systems that take over the attitude control function of a of a spacecraft that has run out of propellant so they're not they're not space tugs in the sense that they move a customer from point a to point b and and let go and go do somebody else's although they they can they can service customers in series you know if the spacecraft dies and then go get another one so i wouldn't call them space tugs they are functional replacements for attitude control and, and station keeping. Basically, you know, mission life extenders. Exactly. Don't they don't they seem to be like a next step? Like, would it well, let me put it as a question. Would it be helpful to point to the immediate but quiet success of the the MEV1 and the MEV2 and say, look you know, this proves that a propellant depot in space plus an actual space tug that could take that propellant to different, even to existing satellites and with the right, you know, connective architecture and the right robotics, you know, oh, yeah. Yeah, we could start yeah. refueling people's, uh, people's spacecraft right now. Well, there are programs to do that. NASA has one called Restore, mm -hmm. used to be LSAT, used to be mm -hmm. something else. And DARPA yeah. has one called uh, um, 
RSGS, which is, excuse me, which is to refuel legacy spacecraft as a demonstration. Uh, they both went at it from the standpoint of, we have the hardware to do the refueling as a, as a payload. Industry has to come up and donate and provide the spacecraft to move it around with the benefit that they get to now use it for commercial purposes, the spacecraft and the, and the equipment kit. Um, Rockwell or Boeing refused to uh, participate in that. Uh, Northrop Gr or uh, Maxar did, and and um, and so they're going to fly in a few years. But 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 that's taken forever. And it really has refueling, Earth observation, geosats, etc. Uh, is a is a good thing but it is a low quantity thing. You know, we're talking one to three tons of propellant per spacecraft. And you have to move around and expend propellant to get to the next customer, et cetera. Um, I picked up the, 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 the propellant refueling of, of the space tugs the depots are there to service the tugs. The tugs are there to provide a service of moving large payloads on a traffic, on a high traffic lane, if you will. Got it. More, more, more propellant, more handling fee, more, you know, it's a bigger revenue stream in my view. Um, That's great. If there's, if there's the traffic stream, then you get the revenue stream. So right. the key is to, to come up with, business plans that require that kind of heavy traffic. And we're going and we're going to the moon. And there are people that want to go to the moon besides NASA. Uh, and uh, you know, the question is how how do how do can we what must we do to compete with SpaceX and Starship? From a price, frequency and capability standpoint. Is there um, is there a significant demand right now for orbital tugs and or propellant depots? I mean, we talk about it will expand our capability. Is there yeah. this pent up demand waiting for that capability? No, no, because we're used to doing business by flying the G GTO mm -hmm. with a, with a large launch vehicle, so. The, the architecture that evolved for CSDC, uh, you know, first began as propellant depots. Well, who's gonna use propellant depots? Well, nobody. So what about transportation and depots are just a, part, a supporting infrastructure item. And, and so going to the moon, well, going to the moon once a year for NASA isn't a big market. And it takes a lot of, a lot of funding to put that earth to moon in place. Where do you get the early revenue? Well, how about right. GTO and GEO? If we can put existing spacecraft on smaller launch vehicles that get launched to low Earth orbit and get picked up by a tug and taken to GTO as a first step, there's no satellite redesign. There's a mission um, operations change, a little bit more risk and getting your satellite out there, but you don't have to change the design and you can buy a lot smaller launch vehicle at a lower price, $15 million, $30 million. And now can the tug do that GTO insertion for less than combined with a launch cost for less than putting it on a Falcon 9 or, a, or an Atlas V or a Vulcan. Right. So, so not only do you have to create the technology, you also have to compete against the established paradigm. Exactly. It's built totally right. the wrong way. And, and, and the next step is, is taking spacecraft all the way to geo. And now you get the spacecraft cost savings of not putting in that circularization propellant and propulsion system. And well, they're using electric. So are you going to compete with that? Well, with a tug, with an impulsive tug, 
you're not going to take six months to get out to geo. Right. You can get your revenue. Yeah, you can get there in six hours and you've got all of your electric propulsion for station keeping. All right. So, you know, those are the arguments and, and, and I have yet to make them effectively to, to sufficient folks or the right folks to get, to get, um, traction in, in building a customer base. But we're just starting to do that, trying to do that. So what, what could we do to help make these propellant depots and the tug system a reality? I mean, we as an individuals, we as in the Moon Society, what, what could we do to help move this forward? I, th I think um, you know white papers on on the on the benefits or, or on uh, comparing the two and, and maybe maybe the promoting the benefits or you know if I knew maybe I would be more successful in, in making that happen. So trust um, me, I'm the same boat. We, we got to keep we got to keep talking about right. what does it take to be a space faring civilization or having a real space economy and how do we make going back and forth to the moon and 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 going back and forth to gto and geo and and other places how do we make that less costly you know we're throwing away 30 million dollar stages upper stages mm -hmm. and not using them to their full capacity let's put yeah. those stages in earth orbit and keep reusing them the, the, the numbers, the, the models I put together for, for pricing show that the propellant, the cost of propellant, that is how much one uses to do a mission, is 90 to 95% of the price driver for a reusable system that has the um, operational requirements that we have laid on our architecture. And propellant's cheap compared to well, propellant's else. not cheap today. Propellant, uh, let's see, the Vulcan, the the um, um, the Falcon Nine and the the New Glenn are down in the three thousand dollar a kilogram in Earth orbit range. Really? Maybe, maybe two. But certainly not below two. Uh, the the Falcon Heavy, um, seven, uh, let's say let's say it's it's uh, I think the price on the website is sixty three million dollars. For no, it's a hundred. It's a hundred, and it's either one hundred and thirteen for sixty three tons, or it's sixty three million for hundred tons. I think it's the other way around. So, you know that's that's the number. And then the Vulcan or the, the New Glenn is 45 tons and maybe the price is what, 100 million? I've never seen a price. So if, if it's 100 million, and you've got to assume that you're not gonna get 45 tons of propellant, maybe you're gonna get 80% of that, 90, right. not, not 90 if, if the tanker is reusable uh, that goes on top. Uh, so, you know, you're talking 36 tons for for 100 million dollars. You know, that's that's 2,500 a kilogram, roughly. Okay. Uh, yeah, if I could put in, um, sure. I think because sure. um, we're talking about what can we do as a group, as an organization. Um, I just was recently reading. Let me turn my camera around. I was just recently reading in the Space Force Journal. Yep. They just had an article this last month on orbital sustainment and space mobility logistics, which talks exactly. about yeah. Uh, this was by Alexander Jaley and George Sowers. Yep, yep, I read that. Yeah, and um, so two things. One, um, I would say trying to find, be able to present the comprehensive view of the benefits of this to more people, and that part of that is publishing in, in the Space Force Journal or others like that. Um, and then also, as we see other people that have similar... Uh, goals and objectives like Alexander and George here, reaching out and being able to link up with them and being able to present uh, a combined front, as it were. Oh yeah, that's that's why we we're on the panel two weeks ago. 
um, George and Edgar and Dave and I, and you know, we've all been we've all been talking about depot since since uh, 2004 publicly, except when we couldn't. You know, for for a uh, time time period in there from like 2007 to 2000, or maybe 2010 to 12, 15. I'm going to just ask, what, what's the URL for the Space Force Journal? Well, that's interesting. Could, could somebody? It's, uh, uh, I'll, I'll drop it in chat. Uh, please, yeah, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an interesting article. And, and, and I've got, I've got um, interactions with folks from that, that used to be at Maxwell Air Force Base uh, War College, and we're teaching their lieutenants, their, their future Space Force leaders, uh, Pete, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Pete Garrison, uh, Michael Coyote, uh, Coyote Smith, rather, uh, for retired Air Force, and and uh, and they've got links into the Space Force. So I've been interacting with them on and providing them some information on 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 them to feed up up the chain. But uh, but yeah, how how do we do this? And and. Yeah. Uh, Seems like the military would be a good, you know, customer for you guys. Well, we 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 proposed to the DIU, the Defense Initiative Innovation Unit, uh, when they had their their mobility or multi-orbit space tug opportunity last year um, to get into the SBIR phase of of getting some of the technologies demonstrated, i.e., the water to cryo process. And, uh, and and we were not uh, we were not uh, successful in doing that, and we've done that to NASA tipping point, and we were not successful there. I'm um, about to do the same under National Science Foundation uh, for the, the the water to to gaseous oxygen to hydrogen as a first step, and we'll see how that plays out. Uh, hold on. Um, thanks, we have Andy, to, for joining us. Yeah, we um, have to be able to demonstrate that capability before people will accept it as viable. Do you think that they're they're hesitant because they want to develop the capability in-house or they just don't see the advantages of it yet? That depends on who you mean by they. Well, let's say the military and or NASA. Well, the military is just coming into, you know, the Space Force. The Space Force is uh, is new and, and, and so their role is is looking out and, and I think they're they're evolving into into that that capability. From the NASA standpoint, it was, it was we want a big rocket. We want a BF. We want a BFR. Well, yeah, they, uh, SLS. You know, we want they, to repeat they, Apollo. They BFR. <laughs> Apollo on steroids, and yeah, and uh, nice. and so they 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 put together an architecture using depots in such a way that, or, or smaller launch vehicles in such a way that it would come out as less reliable or, or lower probability of mission success than those that used big rockets. Right. And that's but what that does is it limits what one can do. Mm -hmm. Well, because now you have to use their, their BFR. Right. And, you know, Mars missions using, using SLS can take up to 23 launches to get, to get by going by way of the, the, um, the moon to go to Mars, just as an assembly point, 23 SLSs to get to the first mission to Mars, whether that's an orbit one or a landed one. We will never and, see that happen. And that's that's a you know that's a launch a year. Is is what SLS is being uh, uh, built for? So maybe two. Yeah, and so you know that's 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 a decade to put a, a single mission together. Right. There's and something wrong with that. Astronomical. Uh, one other quick question. If we're, Dallas, if we're trying yeah. to demonstrate the technology, depending on the miniaturization of it, and obviously I don't know how useful it would be, would small sats be a potential outcome of that? Or is the fact that a fuel depot would have to have, you know, fuel on it? That would obviously limit the... the the demonstrate capabilities of a small sat. Yeah, there, there's a limit to how small one can go and be considered relevant. That was another criticism of what we did to NASA's tipping point is that what we were proposing to do on space station was too small a scale relative to what our operational system would be. And, and so when we did the demonstration mission, 
concept for um, CPST, crowd, crowd gen propellant storage and transfer. We looked at a 20% scale Delta IV heavy upper stage concept, 24% by mass, 20% 20, 20 by mass, including propellant. And NASA felt that that was the smallest we could go and be relevant from a scale wise, from a scale perspective. So yeah, there's a limit to, to how small one can go. That's kind of, yeah, that is kind of a chicken and egg, isn't it? Yeah. You have to be big enough to be relevant, but getting, that starts to get very expensive. But, but you know, we don't need to start off with the, the depots I showed you in Earth orbit and, and the moon and L1 and, and Mars. You know, we could be, we can be a single vehicle depot, but we would only be able to service GTO or maybe geo spa uh, space tugs. We wouldn't be able to service going to the, going to the moon with 25 tons of payload. Well, not with your first one. <laughs> right. I mean, uh, but, but, you know, the, the architecture we have was put together when, when what, we could put into orbit was 25 tons. And so the concept was, what does it take to put what we can launch into Earth orbit all the way to the moon? That's what drove the architecture concept we have today. And at, at that time it was 25 tons. So any other, any other questions or, 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 or comments, derogatory or otherwise? Well, I don't think it's derogatory. I think uh, I think you're spot on. The uh, depots are the way to go. If, you, if you're building a real transportation infrastructure yeah. for cis lunar space, if all you're worried about is flags and footprints, you don't need. You want to go to stay. Reusability has to be across the board. Yep. From Earth surface to your destination and back. Right. However you do it. And really, one needs to break up the mission legs so that your systems, so that the systems only operate in a single environment. Uh, in th space, thanks for joining us, Joshua. Up and down uh, at the Earth or up and down at the destination. Yeah, yeah, agreed. But, you know, build, building that kind of sustainable architecture, that, that costs more than just having single use and, and throwaways over time. If you, it if costs you just, more up front, but it doesn't yeah, cost more over right. time. Right, right, right. It costs more up front, but it's a harder sell. Yeah, right because it, because of government budgets. But if you're yep. if you're a commercial entity, you look at the longer you look at the longer um, track record or, or the longer life cycle costs. Because you want to make money on the on the operation, you you don't make money in the development. So you. It seems to me like as soon as as soon as someone, whether it's the government or hopefully a, a commercial entity, has um, regular business outside of Earth orbit, like at that very moment, a depot in Earth orbit becomes, or, or actually a depot anywhere along that route, right. suddenly becomes, um, like it goes from being kind of an optional chicken and egg thing right. to being immediately like should be part of a sensible yeah. mission plan. SpaceX is going to have one above um, above Galveston, above their their launch site in what South Padre Island or wherever they are. They're going to have a depot up there. It's going to be a Starship depot, so that they can fill that and then fill their Starship transfer vehicle, so they can go to the moon and, or Mars and fill up their Starship lunar lander, or so they can go to Mars and 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 land on them on Mars. They're going to have a, a Starship Depot above their launch sites. Yeah. But it's it's, yeah. And the, the problem is that people who don't understand the things that you've been saying today think that that is just part of this crazy Mars plan. When, when actually, like, it doesn't actually matter whether you're going to Mars or you're going to the moon or you're deciding to, you know, build some kind of, of uh, 
space infrastructure at one of the one of the Lagrange points, right. wherever it is that you're going, like, insert destination here. Right. Like at that point, and whatever craft you're launching, whether right. it's got a 25 ton payload or a hundred ton payload, or five, or, or five. five ton payload. Right. Yeah. As 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 soon as you know, as soon as it's no longer a one shot mission anymore immediately this whole depot thing makes perfect sense and, and we should be we should be moving payloads off launch vehicles and into onto space vehicles in earth orbit and not Absolutely. send launch vehicles beyond earth orbit right specialized yeah. vehicles you know they don't yeah, and that, that makes them easily reusable mm -hmm. i mean not easily but reusable whether they're single stage or two stage or or what have you Right, so now our propellant depot becomes a cargo transfer unit also. Exactly, the cross-docking facility. Yep, and then you can just build out more capabilities from there. And then you get right. stations. Right. I love the term logistics node, but yeah. maybe yeah. that's just me. Well, you know, what, what, does your, what does your man on the street or woman on the street understand? And, and what would, you know, how would you explain it to them? You know, trucking companies use the term logistics more and more now. Yeah, um, cool. And I, I know some of my clients are supply chain. Uh, they have you know, master's right. degrees in supply chain right. and, and in supply chain, uh, right. uh, they, they talk about, you know, logistics all the time and logistics nodes and a logistic node, you know, could be a number of different things, right. including an orbital propellant depot. Right. And, and, you know, space operations center was a, the early term for space station. And, you know, we call we call things on the corner gas stations, filling stations, service stations. Uh, they they are no longer really service stations; they're snack shop stations. <laughs> but, but but you know, it, are these filling stations? Would that be easier, more easily understood by the general public, or or are they propellant depots? We stay away from gas stations because we use liquid, not gas. Right. But, but gasoline. I mean, you know. Yeah. I yeah I like filling station. I yeah. personally I think filling station would fly, and yeah. then when you're talking to the business no, the business community, then it becomes a logistics node. <laughs> right. Right. I think you hit on an untapped market, Dallas. The orbital snack station. <laughs> right, right, exactly. There you go. Especially when we have a hundred people flying at a time versus two to four. That's right. Yeah. I need my Diet Coke. I need my Pepsi. I need my I need my chips. I need That's my right. candy. <laughs> I need my coffee for those that drink coffee. Some kind of well, caffeine beverage, definitely. Yeah. Well, Dallas, I hope that you'll come and join us at Maricognitum next month uh, because the what I am uh, hoping to talk about um, is going to dovetail perfectly okay. in with what you're talking about. So right. I'm I'm looking at the larger picture that is going to require propellant depots, okay. and cool. boy, it would be great to yeah. have you there to poke some holes in some of the things right. I say and and okay. correct me. Yeah, uh, you should probably reach out to folks at the Gateway Foundation or the uh, uh, Orbital Assembly Company as as a speaker. Okay, okay. they're well, building. Okay. They're they're developing the hardware to build. Rotating, rotating space stations. So we should talk to Tether Unlimited too, right? I don't know. Probably. What are they doing? Okay. Well, they were founded to do um, at the a long time ago. They were founded tethers. to to do yeah tethers. The idea right. was that they were going to do, to do centripetal gravity yeah, uh, experiments yeah. and services. Gateway Foundation and Orbital Assembly are more like the the uh, space station in in. Um, 2001 Space Odyssey. Oh, I'm very familiar with it. Of, of that ilk, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I love that concept. I hope it flies. Right, right. okay. Um, yeah, anything else, guys? All right, well, we'll just, uh, we'll wrap it up. Thanks, Dallas, that was an excellent topic. Very interesting. Can't wait to hear more about it. Thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for showing up. Appreciate it, and uh, I'll see you again next month. All right. Thanks, everybody. Th appreciate your questions. Nice Excellent. to meet you. Thanks, Thanks for coming. All right. Hey. Bye. All right. Bye, everyone.